Um, talking of setting up places, yes. One of the things you've done, I think, since we saw you, was to is to set up what you consider to be one of the best. Yes. Theoretical physics centres in the world yes. in Canada. Can you tell me a little bit about what you've done there? Yes. So partly due to my work in Africa, I and I guess my work, my physics here in Cambridge, uh, I came to the attention of somebody in Canada who uh, was the inventor of the BlackBerry and therefore the smartphone, the first smartphone. And uh, so he'd made a fortune due to that invention and he decided to give a large portion of that fortune to setting up a center for theoretical physics. Uh, this was a very clever move because even though theoretical physics underpins essentially all of modern science, uh, whether it's uh, astronomy or cosmology being based on Einstein's theory of yeah. relativity, or you know um, electronics being based on the discoveries early in the 20th century of quantum physics and Maxwell's equations and all of that. So as fruitful as theoretical physics has been, it has not been developed very strategically. People have tended to think, oh well, a genius arises anywhere. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're in a math department, a physics department, an exceptionally able student will appear and um, think of some great idea. So Mike Lazaridis, who's the, 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 the BlackBerry inventor, said, no, I want to do this strategically. I want to create a place which will deliberately attract the most brilliant and adventurous young minds and, uh, and challenge them to tackle the fundamental problems in physics. So the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics was formed. Uh, the name Perimeter obviously means the boundary of knowledge, mm. expanding the boundary. It's a little joke because Research in Motion, or RIM, mm. was the company that developed the BlackBerry. Mm. But most people don't know that joke, um, <laughs> that in-joke. So, uh, so Mike hired a director, as a director, a young man who not far out of his PhD in physics had realized he wasn't going to be a top researcher so but he was very entrepreneurial and with the advice of a lot of people like Roger Penrose and um, Chris Isham and other famous physicists he uh, he founded the Perimeter Institute in 2000 about around 2000 99 or 2000 so in 2008, after I'd won the TED Prize, or roughly simultaneous with it, um, I was approached to see would I take over as the new director of the Perimeter Institute. At that time it had about seven faculty, a uh, large number of postdocs, about 50 postdocs, and, um, and a beautiful building, but it was struggling to recruit. Um, Waterloo is not the most attractive town in the world, <laughs> by any shape or form. Although my ancestors went there, I discovered. <laughs> is that right? Yes. Yeah. No, amazingly, there are amazing connections. In fact, one of the very smart thing Waterloo did, smart things they did in setting up their university in the 50s, was to invest in mathematics. And so they have the largest mathematics faculty in North America now, mostly applied. And then they hired the key people from Alan Turing's team mm. to go to Waterloo and found the computer science effort there. This is the team at Bletchley. Yeah, from Bletchley Park. Mm. Bletch Bletchley Park. Yeah. So, um, so they hired the key, uh, one of the key people of Turing's team to be the head of cryptography mm. at the University of Waterloo, and which is within computer science, and and that uh, and mathematics, and actually. Unusual thing there is computer science is a part of mathematics at Waterloo. Um, the, 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 so they hired some very good people, and uh, rather quickly Waterloo became uh, very well known in the world of computer science. So the first version of Fortran called What For mm. was Waterloo Fortran. So the whole community of that, it's a small town, um, population 200,000. Um, and they um, built a university with maths as the core and then 
around it grew up a lot of uh, companies, tech companies, including BlackBerry. So uh, that's where Perimeter is. It's a it's a very ordinary uh, town in the, you know one hour west of Toronto, but with this very unusual focus on maths and science. And so when Perimeter was formed, one of the ways that were unusual is they they we have public lectures. They used to be at the local high school, which could accommodate up to 700 people in its auditorium. And from the beginning, these were packed. The local town folk in Waterloo are really, really interested in maths and science. And so that has been a great, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I went there. I went to give a public lecture and I've never encountered such an enthusiastic audience. Uh, including at Cambridge. At Cambridge, you know, occasionally you get an audience of that size, but Carl Sagan, for example. But generally, you know, not every month. Mm. Um, Waterloo actually is uh, sort of obsessed with maths and science. So I went there in 2008 um, with the goal of turning this into one of the leading centers in the world. Uh, it's very well supported by an endowment that Mike Lazarides gave and equally by the Canadian government and uh, the provincial government of Ontario. So Mike again established this very strategically as a well-funded uh, initiative um, and he gave the scientists and in particular the director a lot of freedom about how to implement this. Uh, so in a way it was the opportunity of a lifetime. I mean given effectively unlimited resources for what we do because theoretical physics is a very cheap field. Uh, given unlimited resources, how do you use them wisely? How do you attract the right people? What kind of environment do you create? Um, how do you challenge people to tackle impossible problems? I mean, and these are the hardest problems in science. I mean, how do we go beyond Einstein and Maxwell and Dirac and all the greats in theoretical physics how do we discover what happened at the Big Bang? You know, what's going on in the vacuum in empty space where there's dark energy which we don't understand? Um, and uh, what does quantum mechanics mean? Um, so uh, Perimeter is one of the few places in the world with a strong effort in the foundations of quantum mechanics, trying to disentangle you know, the, the craziness in the theory. Um, so. That's, uh, you know, that was the, the goal, and I think because I had experience in setting up centers in Africa, which is a very difficult environment, and, and, uh, uh, and was used to, in that sense, rethinking academia. See, most academics are hopelessly stuck in a rut. <laughs> they think the only way to do things is the way they are currently done. Mm. organizationally. So when you ask an academic, you know, let's set up a new institute, most of them will say, you know, oh, uh, is it going to be in a university? And if so, which faculty? And, you know, so immediately start thinking mm. in terms of traditional, in traditional terms and structures. But these traditional structures were designed for a bygone era. I mean, they're not mm. necessarily the best today, nor the most efficient. So I was used to rethinking everything. And when I went to Perimeter, um, what attracted me is its complete autonomy. It's not in a university. And so it has the freedom to do things in different ways. And I've taken full advantage of that to go faster than anyone else. Uh, the consequence is that I think we are now very widely regarded as one of the leading, if not the leading centers of, the of theoretical physics in the world. Certainly we are growing faster than anyone else. We have uh, probably as high a profile as anyone else. And we're competing very successfully recruitment-wise for postdoctoral fellows, junior faculty. Um, an offer from Perimeter is pretty hard to decline. Um, how do we do it? It's very obvious things which most institutions don't do. So what does a brilliant young scientist want? They want security, they want to know they're going to get a reasonable salary and they won't be missing out too much compared to 
anywhere else they might go. So it's got to be internationally competitive for salaries. Unfortunately, the UK uh, has fallen way behind and is not able to compete at the same level. So you're immediately ruling a lot of, ruling, you know, losing out on a lot of people. Um, and that goes back to insufficient priority the government places on science at the moment in the UK, and it's just unwilling to support competitive fellowships. Uh, but it's not all about money by any means. I mean, can Canadian salaries and, and, and fellowships are lower than the US, but we, but but comparable, uh, in, in in you know within you know fifty percent or so at least. Uh, and then what we do is we provide a wonderful restaurant, you know, so the heart of the Institute is a fantastic restaurant where we serve very, serve very high quality food, healthy, you know, local produce, organic. Um, so we don't have burgers and chips, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, we, we, and we do get our, our researchers, we have about 500, re uh, sorry, 200 researchers. And they pay more for their lunch, and we pers gradually persuaded them, you know, this is worth paying for. Uh, so you will, typically people will spend $10 on their lunch, or $8 or 10 It's not a fortune, but it, it's not, you know, cheap. Um, and for that, they get a great meal. Um, so, and then we have a gym, we have a basketball court, we... Uh, um, we have wonderful interaction spaces in this beautiful uh, building, 24-7 uh, good coffee, so you can get a latte there at 2 a.m. and that way people work harder. Mm. Um, and basically it's an environment designed to optimize uh, people's, so that they can optimize their research. And then of course the key is getting some really good driven people who set the example, uh, and other people then join in. Um, so it takes a long time to build a culture like this. Everything is in the culture, so it's literally true. You can walk in the front front door in perimeter, and I would say, when you've been there for two three minutes, and a typical day, you get the feeling something pretty exciting is going on here, just from the way people talk and interact. Uh, full of young people, from master's students, you know, to senior uh, researchers. Then we did some obvious things, which again most universities haven't bothered to do. So we asked ourselves the question, you know, you want the best young people, you also want the best old people. You want we'll have to <laughs> squeeze it. So okay. So we created a special set of positions called Distinguished Visiting Research Chairs. Hmm. And so we invite people like Stephen Hawking or, uh, you know, equivalents around the world to come and visit for three or four weeks per year. And we pay them an honorarium to do that. Now, in theoretical physics, generally people don't get honoraria at all. Oh. And our honorarium is very modest. I mean, it's equivalent to what, say, a junior faculty salary would be for the, that amount of time. It's very modest. But nevertheless, the people were so thrilled, and of course, once you get a few of them to accept, it becomes a great distinction, and so then everyone else wants to come. So now we have over 50 mm. of the top theoretical physicists in the world mm. coming to Perimeter every year uh, for extended visits. And uh, that you know, provides a great environment for young scientists to try their ideas out on you know, a real guru in the field. Strangely enough, nobody had ever done this before, um, and it's, it's worked very well. Another thing we're doing is creating a series of chairs. You see, in the history of theoretical physics, there are all these great figures. There's Einstein, there's Galileo, there's Newton and Maxwell. And nobody had thought, let's make a series of chairs of all these names in one place. This represents the entire tradition, and using these chairs, you can lure the very best researchers. So now we have 10 of these chairs and then we tell donors, would you like to support another? And uh, they love it because they're joining in this very successful sequence. Uh, they, they have an identifiable contribution. They can learn about the person whose chair they have endowed, like Dirac. Mm -hmm. You see, it's strange. In Cambridge, there's no Dirac chair. Mm -hmm. there's, there's no Maxwell chair in Cambridge. There's one at King's College London. Mm -hmm. There's no Maxwell chair. There's no Newton chair. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
What a missed we, opportunity. We have too many chairs, that's the problem. What a missed opportunity. <laughs> so I asked people at Cambridge, would you mind if I did this? Mm. And of course they said, no, go ahead. And so, so we have. Mm. That's <laughs> wonderful, but we will <laughs> give way gracefully to you from yes. that in Cambridge. But um, turning to the last sort of area, yes. when we last talked, you mentioned that um, well, two things I wanted to ask you about. One was that you had a bet with yes. Stephen Hawking. Yes. Um, Stephen Hawking bet me when we first came up with our model. That's yes. the M, uh, M theory. M theory and the that's cyclical that's and gravitational wave. The wave. gravitational waves will be that's detected right. by the Planck, and our model yes. will be proved wrong. Yes. I accepted. Yes. Um, if I go into space, uh, if I win, I'll go into space, and if <laughs> yeah. win, he'll go into space. Right. What's happened since? Right. So we made that bet, I believe, in 2002, something like that. And um, he was betting that the gravitational waves predicted by his favorite theory of the Big Bang, inflation theory, these gravitational waves would be detected by the Planck satellite. And I was betting against because I found the theory very unattractive and, and ugly. Um, and uh, so as time has progressed, the Planck satellite was built. Um, the, the bet has, has, has always been there. I've pressed him and pressed him for terms of the bet. <laughs> he never quite laid out the terms. Uh, we couldn't agree, he, he wouldn't agree to terms of the bet. But anyhow, um, about two years ago, just over two years ago, um, the Planck satellite had not yet announced their result on this question, but another experiment at the South Pole, a telescope based on the South Pole called BICEP, um, BICEP-2 actually, announced they had detected the gravitational wave. So there was, in fact, that experiment was led by a former student of mine at Princeton. And so I heard the rumors and I called up the student and I said, who is now the leader of this experiment said, are you really going to announce this detection? And he said, yes, uh, it's happening next Monday. And I said, you know, be careful because um, in my view, if you measure something experimentally, don't tie it too strongly to a theory. I mean, what you're doing is finding the facts, right? Hmm. Don't contaminate it by claiming it confirms a theory. The facts stand on their own. I mean, sorry, and, and that's what good experimenters should do. What is really there in nature? Don't hmm. be too much influenced by theoreticians' expectations. Anyway, he refused to listen to me, and he announced it with the claim that this confirms the theory of inflation. So I saw the paper a few days later, and then Stephen went on Radio 4 and said, I've won my bet with Neil, and because this is so important, he now should pay me 200 Canadian dollars. <laughs> the, the reason for that is he'd lost a bet on the Higgs boson where he'd had to pay 100 US dollars, <laughs> and he thought this was much more important. So as a joke, he said Canadian. <laughs> so that, the first I heard about it was that the BBC called me up and said, oh, we gather you've lost uh, $200 to Stephen. And I said, absolutely no way. I mean, the first rule in science is that any experiment has to be repeated. You never believe one claim. Secondly, I looked at their paper, and the paper when it came out had five obvious flaws, even in the abstract, it was self-contradictory. Mm -hmm. So slowly people, I don't think Stephen had read it, slowly people came around to my point of view that the experiment had not proven the case. And then as time went on, in fact, the Planck satellite began to check the, the, using their data against the experiment and discovered rather quickly that the entire signal detected by BICEP could be explained by dust, dust in our galaxy, that it produces a pattern on the sky which can be interpreted as, as, as this it looks like the signal from gravitational waves. The two can be confused. And as time went on, that dust interpretation has gained uh, you know, support from a lot of evidence. So basically, the bet. Uh, so, shortly after Stephen, you know, and I had this little interaction on Radio Four, 
I wrote to Stephen and said, look, let's firm the bet up. Now, the claim is that gravitational waves account for 20% of what we call the anisotropies, the deviations from perfect uniformity in the temperature of the sky as we look out to the Big Bang. So, Bicep's claim is gravitational waves are 20% of the signal. I said, if the signal turns out to be anything above 5%, I will pay you 200 Canadian dollars. But I'm confident enough that they're wrong that I'm lowering the, their claim to 5%. Do you agree? Will you take the bet on those two? Stephen said, yes, the bet is confirmed, they're referees. <laughs> and during the, time, the last two years, this limit on the gravitational wave signal has come down to 7%. So it's just above the threshold where I will win. I'm, you know, I, uh, I'm fairly confident that, it, that in a year or two it's going to go below five percent. You'll have to pay me two hundred Canadian dollars. Um, Stephen, however, you know, I, 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 I want to emphasize that his a good taste in identifying an important scientific question, b his boldness and integrity. He is willing to say, you know, this theory predicts X, and if 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 X is not seen, you know, you should doubt the theory. Uh, he's very unlike most other theorists. So most other people who advocate inflation won't give you a firm number. One of them in California, uh, Eva Silverstein, who again has some level of of um, you know what I would call scientific integrity, i.e., being willing to say. If the theory, you know, if this is not seen, I will begin to doubt the theory. Anyway, she's made it a 1%, and then other theorists, you know, will say below 0.1%. Uh, anyway, so uh, the theory is in retreat. So this is about more than a bet, obviously. Uh, this is about the beginning of the universe, you know, what really happened. It's... Uh, Does it confer, I mean, moving on to another yes. part of your very interesting description of brain theory and the yes. idea of having things which are very, very close together, universes which are touching. Yes, yes. Do you still hold to that? No, theory? no. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so, so at the time we made the bet, I was more, I was advocating a certain model based on string theory and M, a theory called M-theory, according to the, which the world, the universe, consists of two parallel three-dimensional universes separated by a little gap. Mm. And the Big Bang was actually the collision of yeah. these worlds. Now, that theory may still be correct, but what has been so... But, but I have become more conservative in the following sense. Um, it turns out that even if you have this higher dimensional picture of the universe formed by a collision, there is an equivalent description of this whole process which doesn't require the extra dimensions. You know, in a sense, the extra dimension of space could just be a mathematical convenience. Um, and the more we studied the theory, the more we realized the issue we're really tackling is about the singularity itself. And in many ways, you can describe it in purely four dimensional terms, even if uh, I say four dimensional three space and one time, even if there are four space and one time dimensions. You, you, you can actually describe it in terms of three space and one time. So I, I have become more focused on um, a minimalist description of the Big Bang. And part of the reason is that the observations are so incredibly simple to characterize. We see the structure of the universe on large scales. And amazingly, it's, sim it's unbelievably simple. You can describe the structure of the universe on the larger scale with essentially one number, which is the level of fluctuations. They take a very particular form of wh what we call Gaussian random noise, which is like the simplest distribution in statistics. They are scale invariant, meaning that the fluctuations on any scale uh, are the same level. It's only one number, this amplitude, one part in a hundred thousand, characterizes the whole distribution. It's a tiny correction as well, which is called a tilt, but that's really a small correction. So to very good approximation, the structure of the universe is described by one number. That's simpler than an atom. 
the structure of the universe is simplest than the simplest atom. It's insane. And yet our theories are unbelievably complicated. And me too. I mean, I had extra dimensions and brains moving around. And people introduce all kinds of additional components of matter and assumptions. And, um, so the theory turns out to be way more complicated than the phenomenon it's trying to explain. And so this has forced me to, uh, in my own work, try to simplify and reduce and make economical and minimal everything I'm doing. Um, and in doing so, you realize that many of the, you come upon the foundational questions. How do you link quantum mechanics to space and time? What does it mean for space and time, space and time to have uncertainty, as in Heisenberg uncertainty principle? It means there isn't a single time, there's no single space, it's many spaces and times at once. And how do you, how do you deal with that? So I've been developing a whole new picture of how you treat uh, cosmology, the universe, correctly using quantum theory. And we have a very important recent result, which is, which mathematically disproves one of Stephen's most fundamental um, pictures. Okay, it's a picture that he's particularly proud of. And I was also, I've always been impressed with it. So his picture, roughly speaking, is that space and time emerged 14 billion years ago from an event, a beginning. Yeah. But this beginning has a very attractive mathematical form, namely that if you think of space as uh, running around, let's say, an ice cream cone, mm. and time being the uh, running along the cone, mm. you know, back to the tip. And the tip is the big bang, mm. and it's singular, and it's spiky and sharp, and all our equa equations fail. Well, Stephen's idea was geometrically very simple. Let's round it out. Let's just have a nice, smooth, round tip. In order to do that, you had to blur the distinction between space and time, because on the round tip of the cone, you see there's no, there's no real difference between time and space. It's mm. two-dimensional surface. So he had a very clever mathematical way of doing that, which was very appealing and has been very influential, not just in cosmology, but in other areas of physics. What we have proven recently, and this is uh, very recently during my stay in Cambridge, is that that setup doesn't work. Um, that if you begin space and time in a smooth manner, as he was envisaging, envisaging then actually the quantum fluctuations in space and time are out of control. They are wild and they do, the picture doesn't make sense. All you get is a universe that is, that is uh, wildly fluctuating. Um, and so this is a very fundamental result. I think it closes off a certain approach. In a sense, it says that the beginning is not describable, if there is a beginning, it's not describable in smooth terms, in terms of a smooth geometry. There's sort of two alternatives. One is you just say it's so quantum we can't begin to tackle it. No. Or you say that actually it was a singular event, roughly like putting two cone tips together. And as you head towards this tip, the quantumness of the world becomes more and more important. The universe manages to go through this bounce between mm. pre-bang and post-bang in, uh, in a quantum manner, which you can describe. So I've got a very concrete proposal how that happens. It, roughly speaking, the simplest version looks like the post-bang universe has a mirror image, pre-bang, and actually they're equivalent, so you could even turn it this way. No, egg timer. <laughs> it's like an egg timer universe. And I call it the causa sui cosmos. Mm -hmm. Causa sui was a word invented by, um, uh, who's the philosopher? Spinoza. Mm. So Spinoza, um, you know, Spinoza, Hume, and philosophers of, of those times debated causality and causation, what came first. Mm. And if you're dealing with the Big Bang, this is a, you know, 
fundamental. It's all about what came first and causality. But Spinoza advocated a point of view that some that the universe causes itself. It just is. And it's the way it has to be. And it's not that you know, I, I mean, in particular, I think his sub-agenda was to do with God. Mm. Do you need a God to create the universe? Mm. And he was more interested in a universe that causes itself. So that's the scenario I'm developing. There's a lot of mathematical machinery. Uh, I think it's tremendously exciting that the main, let's see, most, most popular viewpoint that we could describe the beginning using Hawking's sort of version of Einstein's theory of gravity, that scenario, I think, is now gone. Um, and there will be a very exciting battle for what replaces it. There's um, still, still an idea that there was something before, in other words. Well, in a sense, you could say that, mirror. but it might be like a mirror image. And so you might say from the before universe point of view that time would be going this way, and the mm. after is this way, but actually they're both the same thing. So, I, I, you see, I'm being driven by economy. The observations show us the universe is much simpler than anyone can have expected on the large scales. It's just spectacular. They also show us that we will be able to look at the Big Bang and examine and answer this question. So this is the other thing I'm really excited about, is that the last year's dis detection of gravitational waves from black holes, you know, spectacular mm. detection made by the LIGO experiment, shows us that gravitational waves allow us to essentially make a microscope which will be able to look back to the Big Bang. This is within our, our you know, within it may be 20 or 30 years, we may be able to build a gravitational micro wave microscope to literally look back, see exactly what happened at the Big Bang. So this is not just uh, philosophy at, at all. I mean, this is we're able to make very precise predictions and check them. So it's e extremely exciting. But um, philosophically, you know, what the, what's the contrast? Well, the trouble with the cyclic universe, of course, is um, you know, what, 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 what set the whole thing going? What were the initial conditions? And so you can push back that question by a large number of cycles, but ultimately you still have to face the question. Um, and, you know, we never really did in our work. We, we, we tried to push it back and we appealed to what looked like it was a natural um, attractor solution. The system would sort of stabilize in a certain configuration. But ultimately, we weren't really answering the question. Whereas um, in this new picture, this causa sui, there is a beginning, okay, but it's a little bit hard to define. You see, a conventional, the, the classical way of thinking about the Big Bang, which I think is wrong, is you've, you've got God or somebody or some law of physics saying, this is how it begins. And then you set it going, and then it's a piece of machinery and it runs forward in time. Quantum mechanics really tells us that's wrong. That's the wrong way to think. The world is not a machine. Secondly, the little thing from which it all emerged would, ha would inevitably have large quantumness. I mean, small things, it's very hard to localize anything. I mean, you said, you tell me exactly where a particle is, and then its velocity is completely uncertain by the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. So it makes no sense to start the universe at a particular tiny configuration. It's like the tail wagging the dog. I mean, the dog is the big thing, the universe. That's the real classical universe we see. The Big Bang is this minuscule entity which should fluctuate around. So what I want to do is I have a big universe here. I have its mirror image there. This is very natural mathematically. And then it's like a sort of soap bubble between them or membrane between them, which inevitably has to cross. For topological reasons, you're forced to have this point in the middle. It can fluctuate around because it's quantum, but there has to be a Big Bang. So I claim this new picture explains why there was a Big Bang, explains why the universe is expanding, because whichever way you look at it, from this one or this side, it's expanding. It explains um, the emergence of time and space. 
and it's very economical mathematically. So it doesn't mean it's right, it may, may well be wrong. But I like it because it's an economic mathematical framework which can be proven wrong, either logically or experimentally. And that makes it interesting. We're going to end there okay. um, <laughs> with my favorite Einstein quotation, which is on a solar mm -hmm. clock in my garden. Yes. Make things as simple, simple as possible. As possible yes. But not simpler. Right. <laughs> yes. So that's a, a wonderful motto. I think what has happened over the last 30 years in theoretical physics is the theories we develop have become progressively more complicated and me too i was part of the membrane mm. string theory paradigm and we've had extra dimensions and new fields and supersymmetry and all kinds of things and experiment in contrast when looking for all these embellishments of known physics have found nothing so the large hadron collider you know found the Higgs boson, but that was the minimal thing. You can't get away without a Higgs boson. It did not find any of the extra particles which most theorists were predicting. It found nothing, just minimal. So I think nature is telling us it's much more minimal than our theories are. And so that is great motivation for saying, well, let's go back to where we were 30, 40 years ago and re-examine the foundations. Where did we, why did we introduce all this complexity and was it really essential? So for example, string theory was introduced with the main motivation being that when you do calculations in gravity, quantum gravity, you get infinities. But these, these calculations were, you scatter one graviton of another and you find, uh, you know, you, you can get infinities. But the argument is quite weak, actually, and because technically it is only possible to do this calculation using what we call perturbation theory. It means by pretending the interaction is weak, and, and then you find an infinity, so there's an inconsistency. If you could do the calculation where the interaction was strong, what would happen is you'd have these gravitons colliding with each other and forming black holes. We're sure physically that would happen, but it's just a really, really hard calculation. We can't see how to do it. And most likely that would cure the infinities. So in other words, people leapt to the conclusion that the only way to remove infinities is to introduce extra dimensions of space, all kinds of new symmetries, all kinds of other problems. But you ended up creating more problems than you solved. And that requires that you really go back, retrace your steps, and try to see, could we not have resolved these problems in a simpler way? And I think that's where we are right now. It's a very exciting time. If we do resolve these problems, uh, and I think nature is guiding us to the solution, this will be a revolution in physics, every bit as important as quantum mechanics or relativity. We're at a similar moment in physics in the history of physics, where the paradoxes are building up to a point where the popular paradigms, all of the popular paradigms, are in deep, deep trouble. And that is just wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> and I'll invite you back in five or ten years yes. to tell them whether it happened. Okay. Yes, yes.